Look, I promise the whiteboard will be back next week. I love writing funny little things on it for you guys. What do you mean I can't write Willem Van Sprossen did nothing wrong? But today I want to be right back here where it all started. Because we made it. A thousand subscribers and three years of Matt's Funtime Bad Movie Show. I admit, that's not a great pace. But you know what? We made it. We're here. And so, as promised, we're going to review my favorite So Bad It's Good movie, The Creeping Terror. There were some movies, terrible movies, movies so awful, no one would touch. Then came a Matthew, sad little Matthew, Matthew decided these movies to watch. For every good movie, there's at least ten bad. Today's episode, The Creeping Terror. <sighs> Hello Internet, I'm called Matt. And today we're going to talk about one of my favorite bad movies with one of the greatest stories behind it. A story so crazy, I don't know how much of it I believe. You thought Dingo Pictures was insane. Check this shit out. The story of the Creeping Terror is the story of a man, Arthur White, or A.J. Nelson, or Vic Savage. Yeah, it's up in the air what his real name was, and there's probably good reason for that. Vic Savage was the name he acted under while directing and editing under A.J. Nelson, so I'm guessing Arthur was his real name. But you know, I've been wrong before. White was a con man working under the guise of a writer, director, and actor. His debut was a film called Street Fighter. No, not the Van Damme movie. I actually have my doubts Street Fighter exists. Savage strikes me as the type of person who would make a fake movie poster to pretend he had more credits than he did. And since this film is now totally lost, well, it stands to reason. Still, there are reports from people who allegedly saw it in theaters, and Nelson's family claims to have a VHS transfer of the film that they just don't want to release to the public. The oddest part about Street Fighter is, while it was written by White, it was apparently the directorial debut of Joseph Sargent, who went on to make hits like White Lightning, The Taking of Phelan 123, and Jaws 4, The Revenge. But we're not here to talk about Street Fighter. Although if it ever gets released, I will absolutely cover it. I want to see this movie so bad. No, we're here to talk about Savage's next film. The film started as a script by Robert Silliphant, writer of The Incredibly Strange Creatures Who Stopped Living and Became Mixed Up Zombies, and Beach Girls and the Monster. And that's it. Those are his only three credits. Wow, I can't believe I own the whole Silliphant collection! The movie was supposed to be a schlocky sci-fi creature feature, but in the hands of Nelson it became so much more. He pitched the film to wealthy investors, shit out a cheap as hell movie, and ran off with the money. It was like the producers, but in real life. But that's not all to this story. This was a mess start to finish. Claims range from the typical, everyone was coked out of their minds, which, yeah, I believe, to the more outlandish, such as White being friends with Charles Manson, because one of the scenes was filmed on the Manson family ranch. The clear explanation for that one is that, prior to the Manson family's arrival, that ranch was used to film TV shows, and Creeping Terror was made three years before the Manson family took up residence there. So yeah, that one's confirmed false, but there are some I doubted that I think have to be true. His wife claims he used to strip naked, put on a German army helmet and Hitler mustache, and tell himself he was a god. Like, that sounds fake, but his wife said it, so... I assume it to be true. Here are some other, mostly true stories about the film. A creature was designed for the film, but it got, ahem, stolen, and they had to replace it with the cheapest creature they could build. The film also had no sound at the end of production. Some say it was because the equipment was stolen, or, more comedically, dropped in the lake. Others say there just never was audio equipment, and others still say the equipment was there, they just used it wrong or lost the recordings in post-production. However it was, they couldn't get most of the cast back to dub in their lines, so instead, 90% of the dialogue is narration. The sergeant, a shaken man, returned babbling about what had happened. 
Caldwell, realizing the full danger of the situation, decided he had only one means left to stop the monster, grenades. The narrator, Larry Burrell, went uncredited for this movie, possibly at his own request. According to one of the producers, the film was nearly finished and he had gone to Nelson's house to pick it up, only to find the house covered in police tape and Nelson gone. He saw the film in a box in the garage, picked it up, and left. That's how close we came to never seeing this cinematic masterpiece. And there's debate about whether or not this ever made it to theaters. Most people seem to think the producers just sold off the TV rights and it played on TV instead of ever premiering in theaters. It's even listed on IMDb as a TV movie. And, at least in my opinion, the film doesn't disappoint. Worth noting, I don't think this film has ever received a standalone DVD release. It was featured in MST3K Volume 1, the only MST3K box set they released with the unriffed version of the films on them, as well as a couple of multi-movie sets. I got 12 drive-in classics, but it was also in one of those big 100 movie box sets. Most recently, however, the Blu-ray for the documentary Creep Behind the Camera about the making of Creeping Terror had a 2K transfer of the movie as a bonus feature. The documentary isn't great, it states a lot of the rumors as fact, and it's just generally not great in terms of production. It's a curiosity at best. But your boy got an external Blu-ray drive, so for the first time, let's check out Matt's Fun Time Bad Movie Show in full HD! Okay, this film is not well preserved. I mean, the producer found it in the director's garage. So, we'll make do with what we have. So, here it is, my favorite bad movie, The Creeping Terror. The leads in this movie are Martin and his fiance Brett. Okay, I don't like to get all, oh, this guy's name, but Brett is like a really Broy guy's name, even. Like, I had a drinking buddy named Brett, and there's, like, Brett from Evil Bong, and let's not forget Supreme Court Justice Brett. None of those guys I would consider upstanding citizens. I mean, Brett's a cool name for someone if you want to, like, do something illegal, but, uh, it's not a great name for a woman. Martin, of course, is played by the man... Arthur White. They're returning from their honeymoon to their home in quiet, peaceful Angel County, California. Martin's Uncle Ben is sheriff of Angel County, and Martin is his senior deputy. Martin has high hopes of succeeding his uncle when Ben retires. Everybody got that? And the narration lets us know that Martin and Brett see a spaceship land, despite neither of them reacting to it. Also, the alien spaceship is just an actual shuttle launch played in reverse. Not even good footage. Jeff reported to Sheriff Ben that a plane had crashed near Willow Creek and that he was going out to investigate. Ben said he would join him as soon as possible. Jesus, this narrator never shuts up. Let's see what he has to say about this weird spaceship. Oh yeah, run away as soon as things get hard to explain. Anyway, here it is, The Creeping Terror. This monster has lovingly earned the nickname The Carpet Monster for how awful it looks. So majestic. The police find where the ship has landed and approach. That belongs to Jeff Peters. Jeff! Jeff! Um, the monster hasn't eaten anyone yet. At least, not on screen. Although, given how this thing eats people, that might be on purpose. Dan! Please don't! Greatest performance of all time. 
Well, one guy is good enough for the whole fucking army to show up. Sergeant, take one man and check it out. Yes, sir. Hey you, one guy. Go do the thing that got that other guy killed. Wow, this ship was clearly well designed for a creature with no arms. The thing in this movie doesn't even seem smart enough to fly a ship. It just wanders around awkwardly and eats things. It's like me when I'm drunk. Oh god, not that. Also, there's two creatures, one running around eating people, and one tied up in the spaceship. By the next day, Colonel Caldwell has By things well day, in hand. Colonel Caldwell had the situation well in hand. You know, it's kind of weird to, like, tell you what's happening in this movie that's just telling you what's happening in it. Like, nothing really is happening. 90% of the action in this movie is just narration. It's basically its own Matt's Fun Time Bad Movie Show review, just without any, like, critique or analysis or jokes or, like, offhand political comments that are kind of shoehorned in at the end of the day and are definitely alienating my already small audience. Trans rights. Martin was outraged by the government's intellectual approach to a monster that had already killed and caused the disappearance of his two close friends. Yeah, he looks outraged. <laughs> Just hold on, he'll get there. This thing moves ungodly slow, so this guy's smart enough to abandon his girlfriend. I mean, she has time to get up and run too, she just doesn't. In fact, this guy will be the only person in this movie to run away from the monster. Also, the monster's mouth doesn't work. This girl does a good enough job wiggling around to look like she's actually getting eaten, but most people just crawl into its mouth. It's hilarious. Dr. Bradford, a sort of Quatermass ripoff, shows up to take over the investigation. He felt that if he could communicate with the creature, it might be possible to advance human knowledge by years or even centuries. Yeah, we can learn to wander around aimlessly and consume indiscriminately. Which we kinda already do. Maybe we did learn something from these monsters. Bro, it doesn't matter how quiet you are, there's no audio. What do you have, Barney? How about a bourbon and seven? Bourbon and seven up? That sounds disgusting! Barney, naturally, was still dating all the girls in town, and he couldn't understand why Brett and Martin didn't pal around with him more than they did. He couldn't comprehend that married life brought with it not only new problems and duties, but the necessary togetherness of husband and wife as well. Since time began, this change in relationship has probably happened to all buddies in similar circumstances. Life has its way of making boys grow up. And with marriage, Martin's time had come. And now the movie's psychoanalyzing itself. Do I even need to be here? Meanwhile... God, this movie has no idea how to end a scene. The next morning, Betty Johnson, as usual, blew a goodbye kiss to her husband. But for the last time. Fucking spoilers! Exhilarating. It's okay, lady. I don't think that monster can duck under the clothesline. And then she turns into a baby. Ah, so this is where Kubrick got his inspiration. I swear, it's the same shot of army guys every time they cut back. Hold on, let me check. Yeah, it looks like it is. Next, we see a kid and his grandpa fishing. You know, I want to make a joke about how they're obviously dead, but this thing is such a non-threat, I'm not sure they are. Bobby! Bobby! 
Why is Bobby not responding? He's not even dead yet. That ran out of film. That afternoon in Muncrief Park, a group of neighbors got together for a hoot nanny. Mmm, looks like a hoot nanny to me. But two young lovers run off on their own, something the narrator didn't tell us. How am I supposed to know what's going on? Just look for myself? Also, they die, but it wasn't a super obvious cliche because then the monster shows up and eats the rest of the hoot nanny. There were like ten of them, and none of them ran away? Ooh, now that's a hoot nanny. It's the same shot again! What happened to the boogie? Oh god, I'm so full. Oh, I shouldn't have eaten the guitarist. I'm coming, just give me a minute. Bro, this movie is an hour and 15 minutes. Pick up the pe- Oh, it's inside now. That's the thing. For as long as stuff like this goes on, I still find it comedically slow. Like, it just goes on and on and on and then, oh, it's inside. No indication that it was getting closer or that it broke in. It's just suddenly inside. How? How did it go through the doors? My God, what is it? I wonder that too, lady. Hey, fuck you for trying to escape. We die like men. I love how casually everyone just moves away from this giant monster thing. Oh well, easier for the eating. Oh, that guy just fed his girlfriend to the monster. What a dick. The monster next appeared in Lover's Lane. Lover's Lane? This isn't a lane. This looks like Makeout Point. You know, Makeout Point. <laughs> And then it humps a car. As you do. Oh god, and these kids have a target right on them. Oh god, I'm gonna be sick. Why do I eat so much? And this is the point in the movie where the narration starts to get really ridiculous. Caldwell conceded to the point of assuring Bradford that they would not destroy the monster if they could avoid it. Like, this stuff should be dialogue. The colonel told them enough lives were being endangered. They were to be part of the second line of defense, to be used only if necessary. If the army can't stop it, then small town police surely can. <laughs> the colonel, more concerned with saving human lives than advancing science, told Bradford to go to hell. And that's my favorite line in this whole movie. Perfect narration. And it turns out the monster was made of sand. Ah, so it would have been a formidable opponent for Anakin Skywalker. Of course, there's still one creature left, and Dr. Bradford is determined to save it. For science. You go ahead, Mark. I'll stay with you. I uh, better take my wife with me to fight this unstoppable killing machine. Such a jaunty tune for a guy charging to his death. The other creature's escaped and is about to kill Bradford, but Martin hits it with his car. Bradford told Martin what he had just confirmed, that these monsters were highly specialized test animals. They were, in fact, mobile laboratories that consumed human beings in order to analyze them chemically. And it couldn't stop after, like, two? Although... If they're analyzing these kids' chemical makeup, humans are made of 2% LSD. He told Martin that the information fed into a computer in the spacecraft. Further, he added, now that both monsters were dead, the computer would activate a transmitter to send the results into outer space. Boy, the doctor sure figured out a lot in the 20 seconds he was getting attacked. You know what? I think there was no audio because they didn't have a script till post-production. He heard the transmitter generator kick on. He could tell what the sound of an alien transmitter sounded like. Yeah, that's the most destructive thing a gun does, pistol whip that computer. And, this is not a joke, he fails to destroy the computer, so the movie ends with Dr. Bradford warning them of a possible invasion. But you know, maybe that'll take a long time and we can kill them when they get here. The end!
And that's Creeping Terror. You already know I love it. This movie is wrong in every possible way. It's hilarious. And I'm clearly not alone in thinking so. Everyone from TV Guide to Razzie's founder John Wilson has called this one of the most hilariously awful films ever. But the story of how it got made gives it that extra little push of insanity to make this my favorite bad movie of all time. And as someone who has seen a lot of bad movies, that's a pretty high bar. So, that's it. A thousand subscribers and three years of Matt's Funtime Bad Movie Show. Sincerely. Thank you so much for everyone who supported me over these years. I I never thought I'd make it this far. And if you want to see the first episode of Matt's Funtime Bad Movie Show, uh, there's a link to it right here. It's uh, not very good. Anyways, until next time, I'm Matt, and this is Matt's Funtime Bad Movie Show. more concerned with saving human lives than advancing science, told Bradford to go to hell. Okay, but how many subscribers to review your least favorite bad movie? A hundred thousand. On it!